All right, welcome everybody back to another episode of the Illinois Green Party. I'm your host, David Rich. I have a very cool recurring guest here, mathematician, PhD in mathematics, uh, Sid Smith. Sid, how are you, sir? Very well, thank you. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely. A lot of people are very excited about this interview. Uh, you're one of the, the hundreds of people I've interviewed. I think you're definitely in the, you're easily in the top three, if not number one. I'd have to check the viewership, but uh, yes, you're definitely easily in the top three. So thank you. So I'm not you, competing. <laughs> Uh, no, I know, but it helps. It honestly and selfishly, it helps grow the popularity of the show, yes. which is nice. And it's also, I just, I personally just love having interesting conversations with you. So, up to this point, we've had you on to discuss uh, his his project, how to enjoy the end of the world, which is uh, uh, noteworthy and, and worth a, worth a, a look at for sure. Uh, while we're talking here, I'm going to post the link to that on the YouTube in the comments um, and on Facebook as well, so you can get there <clears throat> readily. Um, and definitely worth looking into. He has some remarkable information to tell, some some mathematical models, uh, uh, scientific uh, uh, theories concerning, concerning the things that are going on now with the population and the, the global climate change and so on. And uh, it's all very uh, solid, logically, uh, you know, formulated stuff. It's not just woo, um, conspiracy theory weirdness. It's, it's This is uh, good stuff here. So, um Please check it out. But today we're going to talk about capitalism and socialism. I'm very much on purpose. And the real economy. What's which that? Is neither. And the real economy, which is neither. And the real economy, which is neither. Thank you for saying that. That's, that's actually, that's very cool that you said that because there is new phrase out there now. I don't know how new it is, but the real economy, which economics are finally getting their heads around that, you know, we'll talk about this, how literally money has no inherent value. It's completely made up nonsense. There is real value in the world. It comes in forms of resources, um, you know, and the money is just some sort of like, like I think you, as you put it, a veneer on top of like the transfer of energies, mm -hmm. um, that kind of thing, which is very well said uh, and very accurate and precise. Um, but yeah, we, so let's talk about capitalism and socialism. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing the fact that I'm not putting verses in there because this isn't a, you know, I'm not, I'm not suggesting one or the other. I have my own beliefs about it, but uh, let's go ahead. What do you, what, what well, do you, I'm, I'm neither you one, so, so that's, that? that's okay. I'm, I'm neither one, so when it comes yeah, to- Yeah, I'm that, neither one either. Yes. By the way, so capitalism versus socialism is a false dichotomy. Or social is a false economy. There are tons of different types of uh, economic systems out there, and you know right, those, right. those two do not exemplify the two major categories of economics. They are not so, that cool. So, so what I'd like to start with is a question because I always think it's fun to start with a question. And my question is, what does it mean to own something? Okay, no, that's a great question. Um, you know, what what do I mean when I say this is mine? What do I actually mean by that? And I, I don't think you have to reflect on it very long before you come to the conclusion that what it means is that you're the one who gets to decide what to do with it. Right. Um, so, you know, I, I own this computer that I'm talking on right now. Um, I own it free and clear. And uh, that means that I could take it out in the backyard and smash it with a hammer if I wanted. Nobody could say a word about that. Um, they might have a moral qualm, but they can't say, no, you can't do that because it's mine. I can do with it what I want. I could sell it. I could store it. I can, you know, I can do whatever I want with it. That's what it means to own something. Right. And uh, we're going to, the reason I wanted to start with that is I want us to stick it in the back of our minds now because we're going to be coming back to it. Uh, and I, actually, I have another question. And my other question is, why did the industrial revolution, why did industrial civilization arise when and where it did? Because we've been around, you know, for a long, long time, and 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 civilization, agriculture began twelve thousand years ago. There've been almost a hundred civilizations. Civilizations have been around for a very long time too. Why did we get industrial civilization now? And you know, people will offer you a lot of answers. They'll say, "Well, we, you know, we discovered fossil fuel." Well, that's not actually true. Fossil fuel been around forever. I mean, you know, coal sticks out of the earth in places, and oil bubbles up. People have known about fossil fuel for a long time. And, and they might say technology, but, um, you know, that's a, that's a tough sell too, because industrial civilization started in Europe and, uh, you know, the technologies didn't start in Europe. If, in fact, if you were going to go by the technologies, you'd say China should have done it because China invented everything. Um, <laughs> and a long, long time ago, you're right. I've got a, I've got a, I looked up the list today on Wikipedia. It's really cool. I mean, first of all, they invented paper. And that oh, doesn't sound exciting, but it's huge. Oh, because it's, yeah. it, it means that they invented a whole lot of other things, you know, like 
toilet paper. That's nice. Um, paper bags, kites, but they also invented banknotes. Yeah. They invented paper okay. money, wow. right? And they invented printing. And as a consequence of those two things, they invented the idea of civil service and having civil servants, bureaucrats. They invented all that. And they invented it all that a, a long time ago. I mean, the Europeans were still painting themselves blue and running through the forest, you know. So um, it should have been the Chinese. They invented um, gunpowder, right? And so they also invented cannons and guns and all those cool things. They invented the compass. They invented the rudder for steering ships. Um, they invented borehole mining and a lot of other mining techniques. Wow. And they invented the bellows and the belt drive and the blast furnace. And as a consequence, they were the ones who started the Iron Age. They invented cast iron and wrought iron. They invented steel. They invented drilling rigs. They were the first to use fossil fuel. They used natural gas as a fuel. And for light, they were the first ones to refine oil into different products. And they were the first ones to use petroleum as a fuel. So why not the Chinese way back like 1,500 and 2,000 years ago when they were doing all these things? Why did it end up being the Europeans, who after all were pretty dang backward um, until not too long ago? Uh, so, you know, the river of history has, <clears throat> it has a thousand tributaries. And so you can never tell a complete story. I mean, if we had all year to talk about it, we'd still only get a piece. And so with that caveat, I think it comes down to mud. Mud? Uh, yeah. And, and, and I'll tell you why. Okay. Um, so agriculture started about 12,000 years ago, as we said. Mm. And really, that was the dawn of civilization. And it, it largely rested on a single invention, and that was the plow. Um, about 12,000 years ago, somebody got the cool idea of taking a stick and running it along the ground and making a rut so you can put the seeds in it. Because if you just throw seeds on the ground, most of them don't grow, right? That's why nature makes thousands and thousands and thousands yeah. of seeds. Most of them, they just blow away and nothing happens. Birds come and eat them. They just sit there on the top of the soil and yeah, they rot. But if you dig a furrow in the ground, put the seeds in it, cover them with water, up they pop and suddenly you've got agriculture. So the plow is really important and the plow has been in use for 12,000 years. If you go to subsistence farming uh, places where they still do that in uh, the Middle East or North Africa, there they'll be with that stick. It's usually attached to an animal, right? But there it is kind of carving a little rut in the ground. Well, the Europeans got the plow from more advanced civilizations to the south, but they had a problem. I don't know if you've ever been to Europe. Uh, it rains a lot, mm -hmm. and they have a lot of mud. Mm -hmm. And that mud in the fertile areas is very thick and it's very deep, and you can't drag a stick through it because it just gets stuck. So in order to be successful at agriculture, the Europeans had to come up with some innovations. They invented a couple of really cool things. First of all, they invented the plowshare. For anyone who doesn't know what that is, a plowshare is a spike of metal, a kind of a knife that sticks down in front of the plow and it cuts the sod in front of the plow because the sod is thick and tough. And if you just try to drive a stick through it, you're not getting anywhere. So it has to cut that sod. But the other thing is, you know, then you can lift the sod and push it to either side. But as soon as you let go, it flops back down again and you can't plant in it. The sod is a real problem. So you got the mud, you got the sod. So they invented what's called a mud board. And a mud board is that big thing on the back of the plow that's kind of got this big curved piece coming up like this. And it lifts that cut sod and flips it over onto the surface, right? And now you've got bare brown dirt where you can plant. And this is, this is cool. So you can do agriculture. This innovation, though, had a problem. As you might imagine, that plow now has to do a whole lot of work. It's just not digging a rut. It's actually cutting through heavy sod, lifting it up and flipping it over. A human being isn't strong enough to do that. Right. A cow, an ox, isn't strong enough to do that. In order to do that, you need a team of oxen. You need like six or eight ox attached to that plow in order to successfully pull it through that <coughs> sod and flip it over again. Now, in the Middle Ages, a lot of people think they used barter. I was just rereading um, Wealth of of Nature by uh, J.M. Greer, which is one of the books I recommend as part of what I'm talking about here today. And uh, he reminded me that they didn't use barter in the Middle Ages. <clears throat> they used something very close to what we would call communism. Uh, 
the old communist ideal that from each according to their ability and to each according to their need, right? It was actually a system of reciprocity, of mutual obligations. I'll help you by giving you these extra eggs I've got, and in return, you're going to help me with whatever it is I need. And we're not going to sit down and, you know, figure out what the value of each is. We're just going to say, here's what I need, here's what you need. Let's help each other out, right? A system of reciprocity. Well, none of those farmers had a team of oxen because oxen are very expensive. You have to feed them. You have to take care of them. They're expensive to buy. They're subject to die. I mean, there are lots of reasons why nobody would have a whole team of oxen to use. So the farmers had to get together and cooperate, each one bringing their oxen to tie to that single plow that they all used in order to plow the fields. And the other thing is you can't just turn a team of oxen on a dime, right? Um, I, I was born in Salt Lake City and have family there and occasionally I go back. And the streets are really wide. I don't know if anybody's ever been to Salt Lake City. It's crazy. It's on a grid shape and the streets are crazy wide. I mean, like you could sit eight or ten lanes of traffic in those streets, some of them. The reason was because Brigham Young wanted the streets to be wide enough to turn a team of oxen. It takes a long time and a lot of space to turn around a team of oxen. So you didn't want little short fields. You wanted great big long fields so that you could run that team of oxen and then turn it off and turn it around and come back the other way. No single farmer owned that much land. So again, they had to cooperate with one another. They had to find ways of saying, okay, no single one of us owns this. No single one of us can decide what happens. But we all need it. So we're going to have to find a way of cooperating to make it happen. And so what happened in Europe in the high Middle Ages was a culture of cooperative ownership grew up. Um, and I couldn't begin to stress how important that is. That is a kind of social technology that didn't arise in other places, not to the same degree. Europeans had this social technology of getting together and owning things cooperatively in order for everyone to get what it was they needed. Okay, so why does that matter? <clears throat> well, because that led to other innovations. In particular, it led to um, what's called merchant banking, because this notion of cooperative ownership spread from agriculture and oxen and fields to things like selling goods from one town to the next. Way back when, you'd have a single merchant, maybe with a couple of helpers and a guard and a wagon and a couple of horses or maybe just a donkey, and they'd go from town to town selling stuff. But now that you have this notion of cooperative ownership, you could have merchant companies, which is a whole lot of people cooperating together to make an enterprise that serves all of them without any one of them actually owning or controlling it. And so this led to merchant banking. Banking had already been around since ancient times. And, you know, money lending and that kind of thing, that was, that was well. In fact, bank is a Latin word that means bench because the money changers sat on benches, right? And, and you've heard the term break the bank. That's because when the, when the money lender went bust, they'd break his bench. So you had to break, break the bank. Um, so that had been around for a long time. But the idea of lending money to a company, a group of people, and getting that money back with interest, that was a new thing. And that sprang up in Italy in the 13th and 14th centuries. And the led Gigi to, family, right? Yeah, it led to the first European empires. Venice was the superpower of its day. And rather interestingly, it, it also had a social impact because up until that time, Muslims and Christians had a prohibition against lending money at interest. Usury. The Bible said usury was bad. The Old Testament said usury was bad. It used to be a law in this country. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Right. So the Jewish community didn't have this scruple. They were perfectly fine with lending money at interest. So it was the Jewish community that actually was at the center of the banking innovation in the early years of merchant banking. And some of those are still the most powerful families. You may have heard of some of them, right? Like the Rothschilds. Um, okay, so that led in turn to, uh, from merchant banking, we got investment banking. Investment banking is where people give their money to the bank to invest in a company and then they get money back with interest, right? They own part of that company in a sense because they're the ones who are investing their money to make it do its thing and be profitable. 
And this innovation occurred in Holland and in the Netherlands, what we call the Netherlands now, the Dutch Empire, which came along in the 15th and 16th centuries. And they had investment banking. And you may have heard of the Dutch East India Company and the Dutch West India Company, right? Those were the first corporations. Corporation just means one body, but made up of many bodies, right? A whole lot of people cooperating to do a thing without any one of them actually owning it. Now, so you can see where I'm going with this now, because we have all the framework for modern capitalism. And we have a very important uh, aspect of it that we should, we should be aware of right from the get-go. Um, if you're a merchant bank and someone comes to you and says, I have uh, you know, an opportunity here to uh, buy a bunch of silver from Germany and, and ship it south by caravan uh, to the Near East where I can trade it for spices and then bring those spices back and sell them and I'll make a profit. And if you give me the money to buy the silver, I'll share some of the profit with you, what we would call interest. Right. Um, if you're the bank, this is great. You give out some money, you get back more. You kind of have to, right? Because if you gave out money and just got the same back, then you're not making a profit. You're not in business. You can't, you know, buy goods and pay employees and so on. So this system requires that the amount of money being transacted kind of be continually growing. You can't just be lending and getting back the same 500 silver coins every month you've got to get eventually 600 back and then 700 back and then 800 back and in order for the amount of value to increase you've got to increase the amount of transactions you've got to increase how much trade is going on so you've got a system that that is very nice it, it helps people do things that they could never do like plow those fields right you've got kinds of trade going on and shipping eventually and, and so on happening that could never happen any other way. But it has this one aspect that we have to keep in mind. It depends on growth. There has to be a continual economic growth occurring. And if we think about what drove the age of colonialism, it was that need coupled with the fact that Europe was starting to run out of stuff, right? If you want to build a ship and go to the West Indies and get gold and tobacco and bring it back and sell it, um, you need to build that ship, and that ship is going to be made of large beams of oak. Europe was running out of trees. Europe didn't have any more trees. They were after getting them all the way from the Baltics, right, or from Poland, which was a long way. It was expensive. They were running out of other things, too. They were running out of human labor, and they were running out of food. So in order to keep this system going, they had to start looking beyond their own shores for more economic growth. Where do we get the things we need to keep this machine running? And so you got the age of expansion and the age of colonialism. And this is the reason it came out of Europe and not China, right? Because China, for all its innovations, never invented this social technology that allowed the construction of corporations and investment banking and nascent capitalism to occur, right? So here's how we got capitalism. And you can see in and of itself, I mean, these guys weren't doing a bad thing exactly. They were finding ways of making money, but they were also increasing everyone's quality of living because they were bringing in goods that they otherwise had no access to, and they were increasing the amount of trade, and civilization was growing up. I mean, it was all a very good thing. So at this point, we should pause and think for a minute because we talked about everything has to grow. There has to be an increase in value. And what does that mean exactly? What is economic value? Um, it can't be just money, right? It's got to be. It's got to be all this activity, this this producing things, this building things, this building mills and producing flour, building um, labor uh, forges and producing producing iron, right? Yeah. Um, clearing new fields and producing more food. And this is all of this has got to be some kind of increase in value, right? But how do we measure it? How do we talk about it? It all just sort of occurred organically, right? Nobody had any theory about here's how we should do things. Um, there was no theory behind it. And it wasn't until the 17th century and then the 18th centuries, particularly with Adam Smith in England, actually Scotland, he was Scottish. Um, people began to theorize very seriously about what makes this all work because they were running into problems. You know, you had, you had um, an enormous uh, divide between those who were well-to-do and those who were poor. 
right? In the Middle Ages, you didn't really have this problem. Yeah, there were rich people, there were nobles and aristocrats and so on, but most people were doing just fine in their villages, living happy lives with plenty and not having to work too hard, right? It wasn't a bad life. But as uh, nascent industrialism started to come in, it was getting bad for a lot of people because, and, and, and here's why I started with the question about ownership. Ownership was shifting in society and it was shifting toward a particular group of people and away from everybody else. All right, so how do we assign value? Well, Adam Smith looked at this and he said, looks to me like two different things. And he kind of presented both these ideas. One of them, kind of obvious, if I've got a widgets and you've got thingamajigs and I need some of your thingamajigs and you need some of my widgets. So we have to sit down and talk about what's a fair trade. And we're going to decide, you know, okay, I'll give you this many widgets for that many thingamajigs. And we'll bargain, we'll barter, and we'll see what we finally come to. And so the value of my widgets and the value of your thingamajigs is determined by, in effect, what we're willing to pay for them. Right? It's a, it's a trade theory of value. And it's, it's kind of nice because it leaves it up to the people who are concerned to decide what the value of the things is that they have and want to trade. Right. So that's your um, what would you call here? Uh, let me get down to my little notes here. Um, I've lost track of where Adam Smith is. There he is. OK, so the exchange notion of value. But he also had another notion. He said, you know, suppose you have this is his actual example that he used in his book. Suppose a hunter um, is hunting and uh, kills um, a rabbit and kills uh, maybe a deer. And suppose uh, the rabbit takes two hours of the hunter's time and the deer takes four hours of the hunter's time to track, kill, and bring back in, maybe clean and skin and so on. Um, that being the case, the deer should be worth twice as much as the rabbit is worth. And this is the human labor theory of value, that the source of value is really human beings producing something whether it's the hunter going and hunting game or the farmer raising crops or the miller grinding flour or the blacksmith creating iron tools, they're all producing and they're the ones who are, who are bringing the value into the world and therefore it should be measured by labor. So the, you notice these are two competing ideas of value, right? The exchange theory of value on the one hand, which says, well, this thing is worth what I can get someone to give me for it. That's and, capital. The, and, and, and then you've got, well, it's free market. Right. Free market, sorry. Okay. A little bit more. Free market. Right. Capitalism has just another little zing to it. We'll get to. Okay. <laughs> on the other side, you have the human labor part of it, right? That's, and again, that, that's not exactly socialism, but you can see where socialism comes out of that idea, right? Because yeah, I mean, Marx, Marx wrote profusely about labor. Yeah, labor, looked, his labor value theory. That's what it's called. Marx looked at this and said the only way that a company can make a profit is by not denying to the worker some of the value that they've produced, right? And that was where he got the idea of a socialist revolution, that, that what ought to happen is that the workers ought to be the ones who are invested with all the ownership and therefore got all the fruits because they're the ones producing the value, right? That was Marx's point of view. And the capitalist is over on the other side and says, they can't do anything without capital. And me, the capitalist, is providing the value for capital and uh, in the form of capital. And that value is determined according to free market activity, right? Free, free human beings with enlightened self-interest trading with one another. So, and you can see right away how not only do you have two competing economic theories, but you have two competing social theories, right? And those two competing social theories are still with us and uh, still very much form a large part of our social strife. Okay, so here's the thing I wanna draw everyone's attention to. These ideas that came along in the 17th, 18th centuries, culminating in, in, uh, in uh, Marx and, and other people who were thinking along socialist ideals and, and uh, those who were starting to build the beginning of what's called classical economics, on the other hand, um, none of these people knew anything about energy. And the reason they didn't know anything about energy, because nobody did. Energy wasn't understood until the late 19th century. The notion of thermodynamics was simply unknown. Adam Smith thought, well, you know, nature provides its bounty and human beings do things that take that bounty and 
turn it into value for other human beings. But he didn't define what that bounty is or where it comes from. It just kind of was, in fact, he called it free because it just was there and we could just use it, right? So what's the deal with the, the trees in the forest? Well, we cut them down and use them. They were just there. It's nature's gift, right? Those, that deer that the hunter killed, that was nature's gift. That iron that was smelted out of the ore that we dug out of the ground, that was nature's gift. It's just nature's gift. And the value comes with the human beings adding stuff to it. All right. Well, so the problem is, and it's not hard to see what the problem is at all. I mean, think about, let's, let's think about each one of them in turn. So think about the, the, uh, the free market notion of value, that a thing is worth what someone will pay for it. Now, you all remember when COVID struck that uh, the price of oil, which had been going up and up and up and up and up and up, suddenly plummeted. In fact, at one, one day, it was negative $37 on the futures market. You actually had to pay someone to take your oil because there was nowhere to put it, all right? And in the last 15, 20 years, we've seen oil drop down as low as $10 a, a, a barrel and up as high as $150 a barrel. And it's still bouncing up and down and up and down and up and down. So if we go along with the free market notion of value, we have to say that the value of a barrel of oil apparently changes quite capriciously, right? There's no way to say exactly what it is because it might change tomorrow. In fact, it will change tomorrow. So the, the free market notion of value is not a very useful one if we want to analyze what really is the value of oil to the economy, because it can't tell us. It's not capable of telling us in a way that is any way useful, right? It's only useful if I'm looking to make a profit and I'm playing on the futures market today. Anybody else doesn't get any use out of that information. In particular, the people producing the oil they have a hell of a time because they need to invest in new equipment and they don't know what the product they're going to dig out of the ground is going to be use uh, is going to be worth when they go to sell it. It might not be worth enough to cover their investment, in which case they'll go bust. Right. Which so happens not, often. Yes. Happens all the time. Yep. OK. But now let's look also at the socialist theory of value. The socialist says, well, OK, so it's how it's however much labor, human labor went into it, because that's the source of value following Adam Smith. Right. So let's suppose I had uh, a load of stuff that I needed delivered somewhere about, um, <clears throat> let's say, 20 miles away. And I want to hire some kid, some young man, uh, to drive my truck to deliver this load. How much should I pay him? Well, I mean, most people are going to say, what's the going rate, right? What do people do? What's, what's the customary thing? Um, I mean, here's what the job entails. He's going to get in my truck. He doesn't have to load it or unload it. He's just going to get in my truck. He's going to drive down the highway 20 miles. It's going to take him about 15, 20 minutes to get there because it's a highway. Um, they'll unload the load and he's going to drive back. The whole thing might take him less than an hour. So if I pay him 20 bucks, I mean, we're not talking skilled labor here. If I pay him 20 bucks, that seems fair, doesn't it? Question, am I really paying for his time? Because here's the thing. <clears throat> In order for my truck to do this, in order for my pickup truck to deliver that load 20 miles away and come back in less than an hour, what does it do? It burns a gallon of gasoline. And that gallon of gasoline costs about three bucks right now. Uh, and it weighs about six pounds. How long would it take him to do that job without the gasoline? A lot longer. I mean, he can't carry the load himself. It's 200 kilos. He's not that big a guy. Nobody is, right? No. So without the gasoline, the truck's not going anywhere, and neither is the load. Now, he could put it on a wagon. I mean, there are wagons. I've got a couple. Um, but he can't pull the wagon because the load is too heavy. So now he needs a draft animal to pull that wagon. He needs to hitch up the draft animal to the wagon, hop in the wagon, giddy up, and head on down the road. And the job is going to take him all day, right, for the same job. Now, unless the value of the job changes with respect to the technology, and we could argue that it does, but let me get to that in a minute, we're going to have to say that it's not the guy I'm paying who does the work. It's the gasoline that does the work. And there are a couple of other things to notice about that gasoline. I mean, let's think about the horse that draws that wagon. 
um, that horse eats hay. The hay is about a thousand uh, calories per pound of hay. The gasoline is about 5,000 calories per pound of gasoline. Not only that, but the horse takes a long time to uh, turn that hay into energy. It's a complicated process. So it doesn't do just to, you know, add four more horses. Now you got five horses. It's equivalent to that gallon of gas. It won't be. The gallon of gas gets burned very, very quickly and propels that truck at 60 miles an hour down the road. So how fast this job occurs and how much time our driver has to put into it and how much work he has to put into it depends upon not only the quantity of fuel we have, but also on the quality of that fuel. It's the fuel that does the work. Now, people will object, well, wait a minute, what about the technology, right? I mean, that truck is a piece of technology that really is what makes it possible to get that 200 kilo load down the road 20 miles in you know, 20 minutes. Um, fair enough, but how fast is it going to go without the gas? The technology doesn't actually do the work. What the technology does is it allows us to access the energy that does the work. That's what technology does. Um, yeah, I was, watching, I was watching Nate Hagen's the other day, uh, and he was talking about bigger straws. And, and his his metaphor is that you know you have the energy here, you have a straw in it, you're sucking out the energy. He was talking about oil wells in particular, and he was talking about fracking. He's talking about how what fracking has done is not you know, somehow gotten more energy, it just made a bigger straw, right? And technology is like that. Technology didn't create the energy. Technology is a device that allows you to use energy that you couldn't otherwise use or use energy that you could use, but at a much faster rate. So that suggests that a real economic theory of value would somehow have a look at the energy that's involved, doesn't it? Let me pause there and just see if you know if there's anything we want to catch up on. Yeah, no, I think this is fascinating. I love how you're tying the history and the theory in together in such a very consistent and, and comprehensive manner. Um, it's part of your one of your greater one of your greatest skills. Um, I think is how well you you articulate theories so we can understand them. Um, no, I think you're absolutely spot on. I mean, I think the definition in physics, the definition of work, and this is based a paraphrase. Um, is, is the the energy that causes motion. That's what work is. So mm -hmm. <laughs> you're being phys physics wise, you're being absolutely spot on. It's the energy mm -hmm. source that's causing the truck to move. Of course, right. you need the truck for the for the energy to mean anything, you know, functionally. Um, but yeah, no, you're absolutely correct. So no, that's all I wanted to say. Uh, please continue on. This is fascinating. Okay. So, all right. So where does that leave us? Well, all right, so technology has allowed us to use up a, a lot of energy very, very quickly. And so we have an exploding civilization. And I covered this in like two, three videos ago, uh, energy complexity and civilization, how civilization just suddenly exploded when it suddenly became possible to exploit the extraordinary amount of heat energy that is latent in fossil fuels. Um, one of the best pieces of evidence that we have that our civilization is collapsing right now, not in the future, but right now, is that we are seeing a complete financialization of growth. So let's back up and unpack that a little bit. Um, when the whole banking system and investment banking and so on got going, that was at a time when governments issued currency, issued coinage. Um, and, you know, so money was something that the state made and there was a given amount of it and a wise ruler knew he shouldn't print too many coins because if you did that, you'd have excess coins and suddenly people would start demanding more of them for the same goods. And that's inflation, right? And inflation is disruptive to the economic system and you don't want that to occur. But when investment banking got going in the 16th and 17th centuries, they started producing uh, promissory notes, and those promissory notes themselves became a kind of currency. So, uh, and we, we might call them bonds, right? We're all familiar with that term, bonds. You've probably heard the term bearer bonds and that kind of thing. 
A bond is something issued by a corporation or by a municipality or some other organization. <coughs> Excuse me. That is like money. You can buy it. You can sell it. But it's also an investment um, because you expect to be able to trade it in for more than was initially paid for it. That's the reason that uh, people will buy bonds because it's an investment. So, you know, I, I live in a small town in central Virginia. When they want to put a new roof on the high school, they'll probably issue a bond and people will buy that bond and the money will be used to put the roof on the high school. And then over time, that functions as a debt that the town has to pay or the county has to pay. Um, and eventually they actually pay more than they borrowed because there's interest, right? That's a bond. So that's a kind of money. And what happened over the course of the centuries is the nature of money started to change. Instead of states issuing coinage, or in the case of the Chinese, paper money, because they invented paper, um, you got these bonds being issued. And banks did more and more of this. And eventually it got to the point where it was the banks who were creating the actual money. They weren't creating it in the sense of, you know, here's some money, here you go, go do something with it. Um, they were printing it in the sense of issuing loans that didn't actually involve the exchange of any underlying currency. It was all just debt obligations on paper. And we're at the point now, and again, I was just reading Greer's update of his book, Wealth of Nature. We're at the point now where, <clears throat> or maybe let me be fair, I think I might have got this out of Tim Watkins' book, which I'm also reading. Um, but <clears throat> we're at the point now where only about less than 4% of the money that changes hands uh, in the world is actual currency. 97% of the money that actually changes hands is simply debt. It's loans. So all of our money has simply been loaned into existence. And that when you pay the loan, the money, so to speak, is destroyed. But remember that little thing about how banking works. There has to always be more. If there isn't more, the system breaks. It no longer functions. And that has profound implications now because modern industrial civilization depends upon the ability to get money, spend it, and then pay that money back. If you can't do that, you can't put a new roof on the high school. You can't start a new business. You can't ship a bunch of goods from overseas to here or from here to overseas because the money available to make that happen won't exist. You have to be able to continually get loans, right? There has to be credit. If there's no credit, the entire economy simply stops and everything falls down and everyone starves. You don't want that to happen, right? Okay, so, well, in order for the amount of money to grow, and if we're honest, we need the amount of value to grow because money is simply a a, meta, is a caveat, it's a, it's a placeholder for value. It has no value in and of itself, as you said at the beginning of the show. Money has no intrinsic value. It only has value as a claim on goods and services. That's the only value it has. So in order for the amount of money to grow, which it has to do for the system to work, the amount of value has to grow. But if the real measure of value is energy, then the energy has to grow. And we have all the empirical evidence you'd need to show that this is exactly the case. Because in those times when the energy supply was growing rapidly, economies expanded and prosperity increased. And in those times when energy, for whatever reason, wasn't growing or began to contract, then we got financial crisis and depression and the economy crashed. And there are so many examples. Let's just stick with the 20th century for a moment. 1929. We're all familiar with the, the great stock market crash of 1929. But that wasn't the beginning of that financial crisis, and it wasn't the end of it. What really drove it, and Tim Watkins has a nice write-up of this. I've got another book here. Here we go. Tim Watkins, he's got a great blog um, called Consciousness of Sheep. Uh, he's a Welshman. He writes out of the UK. But um, Breakdown is his latest. And uh, he, he does a very good job of, of talking about this. Um, what happened was the industrial uh, economies at that time were all in Europe, especially Great Britain, but also Germany, France, and so on. 
They were all running on coal. They'd been running on coal since the early 19th century. The amount of coal ceased to grow. In fact, in some places it started to contract because it was too hard to make it profitable. They, you know, there's always, they always pick the low hanging fruit first. So they went for the nice hard anthracite coal that was jutting out of the hillsides first. Then they had to dig for the coal that was deeper down. And then they had to start to dig for the coal that was deeper down that wasn't as high a quality. And this eventually reached a point where the economy as it was then structured based upon coal couldn't continue to grow at the rate that it was before. And, you, and, and the way that economies respond to that, since they can't grow anymore, you can't increase value anymore, you can't really increase money anymore, the best you can do is try to pretend to, and then that leads to a financial crash. We got the, the Wall Street crisis in 1929. Same thing happened in the 1970s. Um, the oil economy, starting in the United States and then spreading to Europe, were growing like mad after World War II, um, especially from the early 1950s on up to 1970. The amount of energy available to civilization was growing exponentially during those 20 years. An enormous economic expansion occurred. And then, as a, an obscure geologist by the name of, of Hubbard had predicted, um, the amount of oil being pumped out of the ground in the United States peaked right about 1970. Um, and so the amount of energy available to the oil economy ceased to grow. There were other factors. The fact that, you know, all the really good oil was now somewhere else, in particular Saudi Arabia. OPEC happened and, you know, embargoes and all kinds of things. But the bottom line is the amount of energy ceased to grow exponentially. So you got the energy crisis of the 70s and stagflation, which is a word that has come back into vogue. Um, and to try to fix that by 1980, we ended up getting a political response, which is called neoliberalism. Reagan in the United States and Thatcher in Great Britain uh, figured out how to basically cannibalize parts of the economy to feed other parts. Um, Greer has a word for this. He calls it catabolic collapse, right? Catabolism is kind of the opposite of uh, anabolism. You know, metabolism is when you have just what you need and you, and you have a steady state. Anabolism is when you're growing and catabolism is when you have to start um, shrinking. And so you sort of cannibalize parts of the structure that you have there. So catabolic collapse. Fortunately for them, they were kind of rescued by uh, the discovery that we could get more oil out of uh, the Alaska North Slope and we could get more oil out of the Gulf of Mexico and we could get more oil out of the North Sea. And although that oil was more expensive, it did allow those industrial economies to sort of limp along through the 90s. But other tricks were used too. In the 1990s um, in the United States and their counterparts in Blair and Britain and other places, um, Mitterrand and France and so on, um, they said, you know what, all those rules we put in place to control the banks after the last big financial crisis and the Great Depression, let, they're, they're really throttling those banks. And after all, it's rich people who create value, right? They tell us so, and they paid for our campaign, so it must be true. So we'll deregulate those banks. And that happened in the, in the Clinton years. And that led directly to a number of financial crises. But in particular, it allowed the banks to produce mountains of new debt in effect, mountains of new money. And it made it look as though the economy then was continuing to grow. And for some segments of the economy, that turned out very nicely, right? So if you were a professional, if you lived in cities, um, if you were in big business, your life was pretty good. If you were an ordinarily working Joe, though, life really sucked through that period. And it's only gotten worse since. A lot of people have pointed out that in the 1970s or the 1960s, a fella out of high school could get a decent job with job security and with benefits and earning enough money to buy a house, to buy a car, to get married, to have that wife at home and not out in the workforce, raise a couple of kids and send them to college. That was all possible to do. Nobody can do that today on any sort of an ordinary job with a high school education. So for ordinary Joes, the economy has been, you know, prosperity has been shrinking all through this period. And the financialization built and built and built the deregulation of the banks. And we got the dot-com bubble that burst in 2001. And then we got the biggie in 2008. And they're now brewing up an even bigger one. And everybody's been sitting around for a year or two now going, I wonder when this one's going to blow because it's going to be amazing. Um, because they've got, I don't know, the amount of debt globally is something like four times global GDP. And the thing about 
debt, when you don't have an economy that's going to grow, you know, debt is a claim on future goods and services. And if those future goods and services don't materialize, that debt has to be destroyed. It will never be satisfied. And there are only two ways to do that. Default and inflation. You can inflate the debt away, right? Because if you borrowed $60,000 and all of a sudden that $60,000 is worth $20,000, it's pretty easy to pay back. Um, or you can simply default on the debt. But either way, the consequence for the real economy, for the actual economy of goods and services, is that it has to shrink. And the way it shrinks is through destruction. Businesses go bankrupt, enterprises fail, people lose their assets, and um, everyone is poor. And this is a cycle now that's been going on for 50 years because we built a civilization around the idea that the energy supply would always grow. And now we live in a world where the energy supply is going to shrink from now till forever. Now, a lot of people are going to say, but technology and renewables and blah, blah, blah. We can discuss all those things. But the picture I've drawn for you now is a picture of the past. And all the evidence suggests that it's a very accurate picture. And the thing about these other technologies is there's an awful lot of assumptions built into it. The most important one being that we can somehow just switch as though you could take your Ford Fiesta and instead of driving to the gas station, you could just tie a cord to it and plug it into the wall. That won't work, will it? Well, the whole economy is like that. Right. So that's kind of that's kind of where we are. Um, let me see if I've got anything else here. A lot of people have been asking me, you know, they're, they're collapse aware. How is collapse going to unfold? Everybody wants to know this. Um, and uh, because we are approaching a cliff, right? We are approaching the, the ROI cliff, the energy cliff. We're approaching a climate cliff. We're approaching an ecosystem cliff. And we're looking at the mother of all financial crises. Um, at the same time, we're looking at political disintegration, right? Um, could say a few things about the upcoming election, <laughs> but I think everybody knows something has gone terribly off the rails. Yes. So we've got all these crises occurring at the same time. And uh, actually, I've been thinking about planning a video that discusses that very aspect of things, because there are some very interesting studies that show that historically, um, it's not this crisis or that crisis that causes a civilization to fail. It's when you get the perfect storm. Right. right, or the Dragon King, as they sometimes say, when you get multiplying crises that feed on one another, that's when things <clears> get. <throat> and so, a lot of people are saying, "So, what do you think is going to happen?" And maybe that's what we should talk about next. But again, I'm I'm going to pause there and see if there's any questions or. Okay, so. Excuse me again. Fascinating stuff here. Real quick, Greenside uh, said, "So fiat currency." Currency value is a direct function of energy abundance. This is why your history lesson setup was important framing. Okay. Shane Null just has some uh, uh, icons on there. I think he's agreeing with you. Mep Stance is asking, is one acre of arable land and secondary woodland growth enough to sustain one to two humans with six-month growing season at zone 5A of trying to decouple from fossil economy? Not my area of expertise. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm um, certified in, in so, agriculture. I would I say mean, I think it's, it's, it, right? it's a great thing to try to do. <clears throat> but um, don't, uh, if it were me doing it, I wouldn't try to completely disengage from the existing economy. Not yet. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, one is it's going to come find you anyway, the <laughs> existing economy, right? Uh, and the second one is people on their own aren't resilient. Communities are resilient. Individuals are not resilient. Um, so if you look at if you look at past collapses and you look at what happened historically, you see that those places where there were communities that were economically integrated and socially integrated, they weathered the storm. Individuals don't weather the storm. So I think it's a great thing to decouple from the economy in the sense of okay, in the in the words of J.M. Greer, collapse now and avoid and avoid the rush, right? That's a great thing to do, but don't try to to do it so completely that you end up off on your own without the things that you need to be okay. Focus on resilience. And resilience means, you know, staying connected to the extent that it's possible, <clears throat> even as you become more self-reliant. 
That's that's my only advice. <clears throat> well, I don't know. Yeah. Ask somebody who, you know, wherever you go to, there are people who've lived there a long time. They'll know, right? Make friends. They'll know. Right. And real quick, Team Sosa is asking, is it more expensive to fix an electric car? Real quick, before you try to even tackle the question, if you want to tackle it, um, people are getting freaked out by electric cars because some of the uh, infrequent but yet still sort of odd things that are happening. Um um, there was a lady who was driving a Tesla and it just sort of decided to go into reverse and she ended up in a lake. You hear about this? Yeah. I mean, just so, like stuff like that. I have a Chevy so, Bolt. I, I can relate. I have a Chevy Bolt. It's an EV. Okay. So I, I understand the situation. Yeah. Uh, uh. Hey, so, so Greenside Desk, I know timeframes are difficult with the number of complex variables. True. But can you guess a decade where things begin to really accelerate collapse wise? No, um, but <laughs> two things to say about that. Also, you, you kind of broke up there a little bit, so let me just remind no. you of the usual caveat. I live out in the boonies, okay. and so if my internet does crap out, um, I'm usually back in a couple of minutes, fingers crossed, so just in case. Okay. Um, right, so um, first of all, collapse isn't a homogeneous event. It doesn't happen everywhere the same at the same time. Right. We're already seeing that. If you want to see what collapse looks like, go to Haiti, go to Venezuela, go to Pakistan or Sri Lanka or Nigeria or Argentina. They're all in various stages of civilizational and social collapse. And there's going to be a lot more of them. So uh, I like the way Greer put it. He said, you know, uh, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed yet. Um, and I would add to that, it will never be evenly distributed. So I'm going to assume here that we're talking about being in the United States. So many variables. Um, politically, we're in a very fraught situation because both major parties are wholly owned subsidiaries of a financial system that is failing. Um, so they can't do things, really, uh, to... They can't, they can't choose to do the things that a rational person would do to try to mitigate the road we're on and, and, the, and the consequences we're headed into. And more and more people know that. And consequently, more and more people are simply throwing up their hands um, and falling into silos, falling into partisanship, falling into various kinds of denialism. And so we no longer, we're, we're losing our social unity as a nation. And I addressed this in chapter four of the video series about why civilizations die. This is one of the, this is one of the principal um, uh, symptoms, you might say, of this. So how that's going to play out is subject to so many different historical forces that there's no way in heaven that anyone could possibly know um, what's going to happen and when. We could find ourselves in serious civil conflict, um, uh, you know, maybe soon. But it could also stabilize and blow over and things be more or less status quo for quite a long time politically. Economically, things are definitely going to continue to decline. As I said, I think we're looking at the mother of all financial crises, and I'm, you know, not making that up. You, Go online and look at the experts. And they're all shaking their head. I mean, in mainstream press, right? They're all shaking their head saying, we can't believe that it's still functioning and we know it's going to fall apart. Yeah. Um, and uh, so there's that. Um, we apparently this year are going to see an acceleration in the climate crisis. Anyone who's been paying attention to ocean temperatures for the last 12 months is wide-eyed and shaking their head. Mm -hmm. um, how, what the consequences of that will be, we can't know. And we are still in the middle of a fracking boom, which is kind of keeping the lights on. Um, but we know the experts all say that can't continue for more than a few years at best. And then we're looking at a serious contraction of the energy supply. And that's globally, um, but also here in the United States. So, you know, stressors occur. And the best case scenario is a kind of a stair step. Right. So you have a crisis, things drop, there's a reduction in economic activity, people get poor and then everything stabilizes until the next crisis and it drops again until eventually 
you know, this civilization passes into history and we start to build the one on the basis of the new energy reality, which is going to be a lot more like the Middle Ages than today. And with a very damaged world, right, climatically and, and ecologically. So nobody can say what's going to happen. I do very much want to push back on what I call the McPherson effect. And I know you just had Guy McPherson on last week, I watched. Uh, and I, I, I don't mean any disrespect to anybody. Um, but McPherson has popularized the idea of near-term human extinction. So there are two things to say about that. First, it's possible. It has always been possible, so that's not news, right? Um, all it would take is a big enough caldera, keep your eye on Wyoming, um, or a big enough meteor, an asteroid, right? So keep your eye on the skies. Or what is unfortunately more likely than either of those things is uh, accidentally having a nuclear war. No one would do it on purpose, but it's almost happened accidentally a number of times. And we're headed into a very dangerous, in fact, we're already in an extremely dangerous period. So any one of those things could lead to near-term human extinction. But the climate, no. Um, and, and this is why I call this the McPherson effect. I was listening last week and he was saying, you know, one of the things that'll happen is all the nuclear energy plants will melt down and irradiate the atmosphere and that's it, we'll all die. He seems to think that those engineers who run those things don't know how to turn them off, but they do, right? And of course they would. I mean, look at the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant in uh, Ukraine, right? Um, they had to turn that thing off because all of a sudden there was no water and no electricity and you need water to cool the pile and you need electricity to run it. Um, and they managed to turn it off and they were being bombed at the time. So it can be done, right? That's not a concern. Blue ocean event. Yep. It's going to happen sometime in the summer, late summer, September, sometime in the next several years might be this year, might be in 10 years. We don't know when it's going to happen. When it happens, doesn't mean everybody's going to die, right? The ice will come back in the winter. But it does mean an acceleration of certain kinds of climate effects. And we don't know ahead of time what that's going to be. We can't know. So get used to living with uncertainty. And don't imagine that there's something special about that. Because there has always been uncertainty. Right? Life is always a crapshoot. And it's usually hard. And eventually on a, time, on a long enough timeline, everybody loses. And that's okay. Live your life now. Right? And don't worry too much about the future. Um, yeah, we're going to go through a civilizational collapse and it's going to be really tough. A lot of people are going to suffer. Probably a lot of people are going to die. But don't panic because, you know, you're still going to get out of bed tomorrow. You're still going to have to find a way to feed yourself, clothe yourself, take care of your loved ones. And that's not going to change uh, anytime soon. So have a life. Have the best possible life you can. Live your dreams. Right? That's, I that's my No, I love it. Um... Shane Noel is saying that he learned that Bitcoin uses at least 22 terawatt hours of energy annually. Comparable Bitcoin to the consumption of, of Ireland. What's that? Bitcoin is our version of tulips. So, <laughs> What's that mean? so uh, one of the great financial crises in history was in the Netherlands. And I forget when it was. I think it was in the 90s. Oh, okay. yeah. um, and what it was is people started investing in tulips. And because people were investing in tulips, people started to buy tulips. And so all this buying and selling occurred and the amount of value of the tulips kept going up and up and up and up and up. Um, huge bubble. And eventually, of course, it burst and everyone lost their shirt, right? Um, the tulips don't have any intrinsic value except, except as something you put in a vase and admire. Say, oh, that's nice. And then it dies and you get another one next year. Um, cryptocurrency, like any other money, or any other non-tangible asset has no intrinsic value. Its only value is people will buy and sell it. For as long as that goes on, it will continue to have value. And at some point, someone's going to say, you know, that's not very worthwhile, and I'm going to take my money out of it. And in the meantime, as is being pointed out, out, it's using an obscene amount of electricity that we really need for other purposes. So it's kind of criminal. Um, I, I think governments would do well to clamp down on it. But in the meantime, it's our version of tulips. If you can make money out of it, you know, go for it. I, I have better uses for my time. Yeah, I don't I don't invest in the stock market in any way, but let alone imaginary. I mean, all currency is imaginary, but like extremely imaginary. That's, you know, mm -hmm. currency. I'm surprised. I know China outlawed it. Got rid of it a few years ago. Um, I don't know. Yeah, when it first got on my radar, I was like, how is this legal? How is this possible? This is like 
it's like counterfeit. Like you're basically just cre- in a sense, you're creating a currency that the government, you know, doesn't issue. Why are they tolerating that? Like, and that was more of a, you know, just from the, the sense of like, you know, government's controlling money, but uh, yeah, no, it's weird. Bitcoin's very weird. Um, so uh, Mr. Richardson, the second is asking in this century. What's that? Oh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Sid? Sid, you there? Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, cool. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah. So uh, Mr. Richardson, the second is asking if he thinks it will. Whoops, the peak has gone again. Wait for him to come back. <whistles> Mr. Richardson, I'm assuming he's going to say he doesn't know. You know, that is certainly possible. Like there's going to be aspects of it that we're going to watch. We're watching it now. Look at all the craziness of the weather that's going on. You know, west, just west of San Francisco, they got like 12 feet of snow. What? Uh, New England got like almost no snow this year. They got rain during the winter. What? You know, the, the wildfires in Texas. The globe is definitely, excuse me, warming. Richelieu. Okay, thank you. <laughs> you know, notice I kept calling you Mr. Richardson the second. Thank you, sir. Uh, Richelieu. Okay. And we're waiting and we're waiting. And hopefully I'll make it back. Because he's awesome. And yeah, you guys want to keep commenting and see what happens here. Do, 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 do. Don, are you watching? Sid knows car. Oh, does he? Oh, there he is. You there? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Okay, great. Can you hear me? I can. Now I can. All right. Not too okay. bad. Okay. Good. So, yeah. So, uh, Richelieu Richardson the second was asking if you think that's going to, civilization collapse is going to happen in this century. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, it's wow. going to happen before I'm dead <laughs> and I live my natural span. Um, we'll see it. Yeah. Um, but uh, I mean, again, you don't go from business as usual, uh, on Thursday to Mad Max on Friday, right? That's not how it works. Collapse has already begun. It's happening all around us right now. It's happening in real time. You're witnessing it. Um, and it's just going to continue to play out. Arguably it started maybe 50 years ago. Uh, in the seventies with the long process. Sorry. Well, like you said, I mean, it's just it's it's discer- disconcerting to watch the whole election cycle and the chaos there. I mean, because both sides seem well, definitely one side is extremely volatile um, <laughs> and violent. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the other side is getting kind of sick enough of the other side uh, to the they might get just as ornery. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. Um, so yeah, okay. Um, well, it, 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 we're over an hour, so that was fabulous and extremely interesting. Everybody loved that. Great conversation. Um, so thank you so much. Always a pleasure to have you on and talk about uh, things. Um, and I love how you just you're so good at just tying it all together like Great. that. Um, I don't know when. What? I don't know when this new video will be out. It's probably I don't know when this new video on capitalism, socialism, and the real economy will be out. Um, but it, it, you know, I will do my best to have it out with, with before more than a couple of months go by. We'll just have to see. I've got other things, you know, life has to be lived. Um, and you might guess it takes a while to make those videos. So, uh, no, a lot of hours going to them. So I'm glad you do it. So yeah, Greens, I was asking how many, uh, Greens, I was asking how many, oh, Barbara Sussman. Thank you for watching. Barbara is an immigration lawyer who's going to come on soon and tell us what is actually going on at our borders. Um, cause you know, I, I, you hear like, oh, there's 8 billion Good. people crossing them every day. You know, <laughs> you're like, really? Um, so like, you know, um, but I look forward to that, you know, you know, Greer, JM, JM Greer on his blog just today, um, had published an essay on that very subject, which is very enlightening. So you might like to take a look at that. Echosophia.net. Uh, Echosophia.net. Is where his blog is. Very good. 
Shawn Michael Greer is unbelievable. I, I, I keep uh, randomly, I, 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 and infrequently, I, I keep sending him emails to see if he'll like pick up. I would love to have him on the show. If he ever gets on the show, said you can you can be my co guest or co host. Um, I think that'd be an amazing conversation, the three of us. Um, uh, so Greenside is asking, how many more videos in your series can they expect about? Are you just going to keep doing? I'm breaking up. I can't. I can't hear it. Uh, Greenside is asking how many videos in your series to, there are, are to come yet. No, I, I couldn't hear that. So I'll tell you what. Um, if you can hear me, ask. Nope. Okay. All right. Let's see if it comes back. That might be it, folks. Hold on. Oh, there it is. Um, so, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yes. So, <clears throat> since you were breaking up, I think this is going to keep happening. Ask people to put their questions in the comments section. Okay. Um, and I will read those and I will respond to them as I can. Okay. So we can hear you. Everybody just, you know, that's what they're doing. So the comment sections on Facebook and YouTube show up here in the comment section on StreamYard. So just go ahead. He can read all these now. If you have any more, just put them in there and he'll get to them as soon as he can. All right, Mr. Sid Smith, thank you so much. As always, a pleasure, sir. Thank you. And I will be in touch with you sooner than later. Everybody, thanks for tuning into the Green Party series. I'm your host, David Rich. Thank so you. next time, be good. I look forward to next time. Absolutely. Be green. All right, guys, take care.